thank you everybody for joining us today. So we heard enough about myself already. So what I would like to do today is to take the next 30 or 40 minutes to walk you through several research case studies. What we wanted to do is kind of take you on a journey through our world at RI and Gazelle, what we have learned from analyzing and, and cross-referencing company and industry data that helps us in our, our outreach efforts and business targeting efforts um, throughout the years. We wanted to really test how firm level big data cannot just confirm some of the ongoing trends affecting economic development, but also how it helps us identify additional details within each of these trends that can really help us to fine tune industry strategies and make our outreach efforts and those of our clients more effective. The reason why we kind of wanted to, to take this topic that we are constantly battling the lag of release dates of government data. If you're lucky, you might get something that's six months old, but mostly you're dealing with annual data. There's a lack of geographic or industry detail. And so we really were forced, as probably many of you, to find alternatives to much of those traditional data sets and trying to use firm level indicators that can really help pinpoint and further profile not just what happens to individual firms, but whole sectors as well as regions when it comes to opportunities for growth. Looking at it from a perspective, kind of like leading indicators, um, those that you use for business cycle analysis and industry forecasts, analyzing signals in and around companies can really give you a more near-term insight into what is happening in certain industries and help refine your targeting strategies, of course, in combination with your knowledge of your local assets and your local markets. One reason why digging into these, these industries and some of these case studies um, was important to us is that many of our clients and many of those of you that work in, in the business, not just extraction, but also in the retention expansion space, have most of the time a particular sector in mind for your initiatives um, or have developed very specific target uh, and sector strategies. The problem is achieving success might be much more difficult if you're targeting a subgroup of firms where the diversity of growth companies or potential growth companies in an, in an overall sector is fairly low. Once you go down the wrong path and allocate resources, whether it's for marketing or for actual outreach, or for workforce development, it's very kind of hard to, to spin around and, and reassess. So as, as in all our work, we're really trying to use data to find the best starting point. Of course, of course, it's never easy as just looking at one or two indicators to find growth patterns and the signals that kind of we look at um, will invariably differ from sector to sector. So what we did is our Chief economist at, at ROI and our AI researcher, Dr. Hugh Kelly, dug out some of the key findings from our world at Gazelle that relate to much of what you've heard about in the media in the, in the past couple of years and what you have been struggling with and hopefully give you some additional insight. Our starting point for us to find patterns across potential growth firms. We looked at over 250,000 of them. And I keep referring to them as potential growth firms, as those are companies that we tagged for potentially announcing expansions. Um, some more likely than others, of course, it's a spectrum. So they haven't actually completed the expansion plans yet, but based on, on our AI and our analysis of trends and the history of these companies in the sectors, we looked at the ones that are more most likely to have a high propensity for expansion. The question is, of course, how diverse are these sectors? Um, I think if you have seen any of our previous um, presentations, you've probably heard us say, well, you know, gazelles are everywhere. You can always find some growth companies. But when you look at it from an industry perspective, you know, how diverse are these sectors really in terms of the presence of, of high growth companies or potential gazelles? The more you analyze the information for individual sectors, 
just like you have leading indicators separately for the chemical sector than from food processing, the more insight you gain what is really driving a particular sector and what markets within these sectors really are right now trending more than others. So the first kind of case study we looked at is kind of more of an overarching theme for, for the presentation and for the next uh, two case studies is the topic of industrial diversity. So really digging in a bit more into where those gazelles are. What we did is we created a concentration index. Um, for those familiar kind of with the entry trust world, uh, we used the Herfindahl index, always often used as a measure of market competition or rather lack thereof. And we looked at the firms that we track to see how many of those firms from a particular six digit next code dominate the two digit sector in terms of the number of businesses. So how much of a market share do the companies have uh, from one specific next code within the overall two digit sector? Comparing then the concentration of just the companies with a high potential for growth that we scored very highly relative to how concentrated the sectors generally shows us an excess concentration. So in an industry that could any base be dominated by just one, one uh, specific subsector, how much more concentrated are the potential gazelles? So if all potential high growth firms in retail, for example, are dominated by just one six digit next code, but overall the sector is very diversified and there's a lot of different types of companies across, across a lot of different next code next goals, excess concentration would be high. Now, we will go through many examples across these case studies, so just bear with me if it sounds a bit technical. But what the numbers did tell us is that if you're developing a sector strategy, you need to really pay attention when you see these high excess concentration group to a particular subset of industry to really allocate your resources most efficiently. The challenge really comes when you're trying to prepare for business cycles or diversifying your economic base to figure out where you start your journey and where you concentrate your efforts. When we looked at our 16 or 17 sectors, um, we found that over a third of these sectors had a very high concentration of high growth firms. So if you look at this table, it shows you the different sectors, those are the two digit next codes. It shows you in the first column how concentrated, how few NAICs are driving that sector. So, of course, some sectors have much fewer NAICs than others. But for example, the NAICs sector that starts with 3 3, which is metals and fabricated metals, equipment, machinery, is very diverse. There's a lot of different types of NAICs codes in there. The second column shows you how concentrated the potential. Well, actually, it's the third column technically, the top group concentration index, shows you how concentrated the potential high growth firms are within a, a single six digit NAICS. And again, high excess concentration is where those high growth firms are much more concentrated in one or few NAICS relative to what is typical for the sector overall. And without getting into the details of the scale of, of the numbers and so on, Anything really with an index over 2000 is considered a very high concentration. So, it, for example, as you might expect, the, the professional, scientific, and technical workers again are driven by a lot of different next code, next codes, and the diversity in growth um, is substantial. So, you have a very low concentration index. But with, we saw that there's certainly a, a range of sectors finance, materials, wholesale, foods that have concentrations of potential high growth firms more than 200% higher than the baseline. So that is really something where everything is clustered in some specific niche subgroups. And I think this sector is for us really one of, was one of the most telling ones. So we looked at what specific six digit nates dominated the share of potential high growth firms. It shows that that usually there's only one major six digit NAICS that captures a lot of the high growth firms, making it a top targeting priority. So for example, in finance, where we have a fairly diversified set of companies representing many different NAICS, 
the potential gazelles right now are concentra concentrated highly in consumer lending. And the concentration drops off radically after that. So targeting the other NAICs is predicted to yield a much lower conversion rate. Of course, this is something that can change every time information about companies, industries, or regions are updated and become available. But we talk a bit more about the different types of signals uh, a bit later. There are some unusual sectors in the set as well, such as the education sector, uh, which is without K through 12, which shows a negative access concentration. So here the high growth firms actually, or institutions, I guess in this case, a combination of those, are spread out more evenly across the six digit NAICs than the overall sector. And we look into the education as a separate case study a bit later as well. Well, this means so that it makes focusing on just the top NICs not as a higher priority and a valid strategy to include uh, a wider range of, of industries when you're targeting the education sector. So for us, it gave us a really good insight where we're finding sector strategies and being aware of some of the subtrends becomes much more important than in other sectors. And we took two of those uh, areas and pick them apart a bit more. We chose retail as the first industry example because it has been such a disrupted sector with the rise of e-commerce. Although the prediction of 30% uh, or more takeover of the market uh, that people predicted some years ago uh, has not really taken place or at least not yet. There was still a lot of upheaval, bankruptcies, and impact on malls and retail neighborhoods. Our data showed a high concentration of retail businesses, which leaves out franchises and most of the really small retail, and many of them reflecting e-commerce. But even more concentration was found for potential high growth companies. Our data also told us that the potential growth companies are mostly focused on one specific next code. So we thought we'd dig a little deeper. Uh, the closure of, of the major bricks and mortar retail stores over the last 10 years, um, of course, has mostly been blamed on the rise of Amazon and, uh, and the resulting flourishing of e-commerce, which is really just a reflection, of course, of consumer behavior. They want the convenience. They want the expedient shopping experience. But as Forbes magazine and economists have pointed out, um, it's not the death of retail, but really just a sectoral restructuring, which of course always leaves some parts of the market behind. And in this case, it was kind of the middle market stores like Sears. Our analysis showed that the concentration of potential high growth firms really is dominated by one NAICS, that's the 452319, all other general merchandise stores. So what that really reflects is a group of lower cost, diversified, especially retailers, one that have not one specific product line. And that, for example, um, is reflected by dollar stores. They've been doing really well. They've opened up dozens of new locations in the past year. And at the same time, the share of potential high growth firms in the e-commerce sector was much smaller. So there was, there was a much uh, more uh, concentrated group of companies that made it work there, probably because of, of a higher competition. So the next next that stood up, even though it was a much smaller concentration of high growth firms, were Again, something that you have heard about, you know, that are doing pretty well, which are the, the Walmart and Costco's of, of the world. And again, the ones with broader, lower cost product lines. But as Forbes magazine said, that does not really imply that physical retail in the traditional sense is dead, but boring retail is. So there are still some growth pockets across the board. Many specialized retailers have succeeded. They're just more dispersed across six digit NAICs and would rather call for a targeting strategy by individual companies uh, rather than focusing on a NAICs code and on economic development strategies supporting the innovation of the local companies. 
brands like beauty products retailer Sephora, they have implemented award-winning apps, loyalty programs, personalized shopping experiments, experience, and especially integrating the physical and digital retail for the clients. You also have the case of the new downtown experience stores. Those are the larger retail chains, including IKEA, that have noticed that in order to even get people out to the suburban malls where they have their typical uh, warehouses and, and shopping districts, you really need to appeal to downtown customers where they can walk in the store and look at products and get them engaged and provide consulting services. And that is where they're putting their money now in terms of new investments and, and opening of new stores. Because after all, the, there are almost 200 retail companies in the Inc. 5000 of, in the last uh, listing of fast growth companies. So there's certainly a, a large group of companies who make it work. Many of those, they already have obviously proven their growth, at least in revenue. They're actually not big shops, uh, which have often a harder time reinventing themselves, but smaller innovative companies. Over half of the retailing 5,000 last year had an annual revenue of two to 10 million, which puts them much more in the mid-market sector. Again, something that will impact economic development strategies for supporting existing businesses and bringing in new growth. We can also see that our potential gazelles can be found across the nation. And I'm not just talking about population centers, but it shows us, for example, that Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, is on top of the list. They have a strong infrastructure, the logistics assets. They've experienced really a growing population, a healthy economy. And that, combined with reasonable rental rates, has been really driving their retail and e-commerce sectors with new Costco facilities, new Amazon facility opening, but also their malls and revived downtowns attracting a diversity of new retailers. But the fact that outside the dollar store type companies, high growth firms are spread across such a large set of markets and types of products, given the sheer size of the sector, makes it really hard to use just NAICS codes for understanding new market trends. So not only was it a very concentrated market on, in terms of NAICS codes, where the growth was expected to happen in the near future, but if you wanted to broaden your development strategy and sector strategy beyond that, you really had to get away from NAICS codes and find other signals. I mentioned earlier that there are a variety of signals that tell us which companies are primed for growth in the near future. And that is for us really a way to weed out growth within these uh, type of larger sectors. Very broadly speaking, you can analyze companies based on three categories of signals. Firm level, such as the age of the firm, industry level, the performance of the industry that the company is situated in, with of course, with the thinking, whether it's a cluster effect or just a general, you know, the, the rising tide lifts all boats uh, approach, as well as the regional level, such as demographics. So the kind of who, what, and where to, so to say. And looking at how different scales of these variables impact the share of potential growth companies gives us, an, and our AI for that matter, <laughs> insights into where each firm is located on the growth spectrum and how the signals might impact its propensity to expand in the near future. The question, of course, is that many people ask us, so which ones matter most? And um, of course, we can't give you all the secret sauce, but from a just from an analytical standpoint, what we did, we looked at the top 20 most important signals across all these two digit NAICS sectors. We analyzed them all separately because as I said, every sector has, has a little bit of its own peculiarity and, and growth drivers. 
And we found that almost half of the firm variables will find their way into the top 20 and about 11 or 12 percent of the regional and industry variables, which are much more extensive because we're looking at everything from, from infrastructure and different age groups and, and different financial ratios for the industries and so on. So each of them has their role and which one is in the top two spot versus the top 18 spot will vary over time and will vary by sector. But there's still some commonalities as well. One of those commonalities is business taxes. So that is something that has shown up across the board in all the sectors in the top signals. The business taxes here we define uh, based on the Ernst & Young research as the business state and local tax burden as a percent of private GDP. And if you're just trying to do a fairly simple statistical analysis with a linear regression, it gives you a U-shape, a story of very low business taxes can coincide with a high share of growth firms, which is, of course, what many people like to hear. But then once you move to a slightly higher tax burden, you will find fewer and fewer regions with a high share of growth companies. Again, so you know, jibes with, with common understanding of, of the impact of taxes. But then there's also a group that really, despite very high tax burdens, can still produce a large number of high growth firms, for example, Massachusetts. So we really wanted to see, on one hand, we are aware that, again, we are analyzing hundreds and hundreds of signals, and we know one, sig one signal and one factor alone is not going to give you the answer. And also just changing one factor will not suddenly have you produce a higher number of high growth firms. That would be nice, but unfortunately it is not as easy. But we kind of wanted to dig a little bit deeper. Um, there's such a variety of regions and so many more signals that a traditional regression like that, where you just force a line through most of the points, didn't really capture what, what we think was happening from, from county to county. And this is what we're looking at. So we looked at all individual counties uh, and compared those to each other and their share of high growth firms. Once you put more weight on what happens in regions with just a bit higher or a bit lower tax burden and how they're performing in terms of their share of, of high growth firms, following the experience of all the different countries, county, counties more closely, you actually see that their regions with slightly higher business taxes all else being the same, can coincide with an actual higher share of potential growth companies. So it's never as straightforward to figure out what is driving these growth companies and their presence. And there are certainly factors that can compensate for other shortcomings in a region for a while uh, anyways. So looking at this example of just one of the regional drivers was just to show how there tend to be several sweet spots usually when it comes to what is associated with the presence of high growth companies. We chose education and workforce as the next two case studies, as they tie to, of course, into one of the key growth drivers as well as site selection factors for companies. Human capital, you know, where we see again these kind of nonlinear trends is something on the top wish list for any company we talk to certainly, and certainly also a, a key challenge for any of your existing companies. What stood out in the education sector was that the companies we analyzed were not just very concentrated in a few NAICs, focused on post-secondary education and education-related services, but also that the concentration of high performers can be found across more sectors than what is typical overall. So it's not as important to narrow down on a specific NAICS if you want to pinpoint growth. In fact, looking at the top three NAICS for the potential high growth firms, the first two are much closer in importance than in the previous examples. So when we had the 
concentration index that you know in some cases for retail had over 2000 in the first next and was a clear dominating next code and the rest of the indices was down in the 300 and 400s for education these were much closer together the first one that dominates was the miscellaneous schools and instruction now this represents actually many of more of the lifestyle related education offerings so it's less related to workforce training but it also often classifies companies because not to forget we're looking at companies and how they're attacked with next codes it also often classifies companies that don't fit neatly into one of the existing next subcategories or that might offer less traditional training or just have instruction as one of their business activities so for example you have cq fluency i thought that was an interesting company they're generally a translation and interpretation service it's a very specific sector focus for healthcare and life sciences but they also offer training in cultural adaptation so something that is is not a, you can't get a certificate in it and it's not actual translation so they kind of fall under this miscellaneous in, instruction and, and schooling and they have been on the inc 5000s five years in a row in comparison the traditional higher education sector with uh, colleges and universities and professional schools has a smaller representation of potential high growth firms which certainly aligns with many reports about the challenges of a lot of these in institutions that they're facing when you're looking at education as a sector strategy such as the popular kind of ed and med strategies, you know, when they go for education and medical uh, sectors um, that often intertwine, it means you really should look at more than just the top next code, so even beyond, and have a more diversified targeting strategy. Of course, they serve very different purposes, as I mentioned before. Some are more about quality of life, uh, you know, private sports coaching. Um, Others are about workforce training. But looking at education from a broader perspective and with the rise and need for alternative and expanded offerings to students and alternative learners, the overall industry performance in these top next schools can also give you some more guidance. So that's kind of where we combine some of our industry data um, that's still based on, on company information with the individual companies' performances and our projections. So if we look, for example, at the traditional sector of colleges, universities, and professional schools, they show a continued decline in profits over the last uh, six years. Of course, that still this is across the whole sector. Of course, there's still you know, quite a few institutions are doing quite well. But across the board, they've seen over the last three years, uh, particularly a decline in profits. So there has been some up and down. Educational support services, on the other hand, that reflect testing services and other non-instructional services, they have seen an uninterrupted rise in profits. Now, these include companies, for example, as Appleton Learning. They're located in Huntsville, Alabama. They're providing standard learning programs, test prep courses, tutoring services. And they have been on the Inc. 5000 list uh, two years in a row as well. So for regions that are, for example, going for an edemet economic development strategy, being aware of trends in these non-traditional sectors is important for a broader, more comprehensive uh, cluster growth strategy. And maybe you know putting some of these sectors ahead of the traditional sectors when it comes to increasing the outreach the support uh, their engagement um, or potentially attracting some of these companies into your region to supplement the overall offerings and we found it interesting to see how these firm level analyses can provide some of these first insights especially if you're reviewing sectors that are rather new or emerging in your region and that you don't have such a good handle on Another way to look at how training and the workforce have shifted is to take a different look at key generations 
impacting human resource and economic development policies. Generation X and the millennial generation, at least the part that's currently clearly in the workforce, have been in the news and research of the past years and C2ER uh, themed the last conference uh, in 2018 um, about this topic as well. Millennials surpassed uh, Gen X as, as the largest demographic in the labor force in 2016, according to Pew. And there has been a lot of talk about and initiatives on how to attract millennials and retain them. <laughs> but more recently also about the importance of a solid Generation X space those that will fill senior ranks in companies, and those that can provide specialized talent and specific experience of, of 10, 15 years. So we thought we'd take a look at how the ratio of Generation X to millennials in the workforce across all the countries in the US relates to the share of predicted growth companies in those counties. Again, just trying to fit a simple curve, shows that there's a group of counties where a low or equal share of Generation X to Millennials is associated with a rather lower share of potential growth companies. In the mid-range, again, that's, that's based on those in the workforce, which are only starting uh, now to accumulate work experience in the Millennial group. In the mid-range, with slightly more Gen X to Millennials, there's a clear positive association with growth companies. But once you have a much higher share of Gen Xs, then that benefit appears to fall off again. If we dig deeper, we actually see that the relationship is even more complex. If you look at all the counties and what their experience are in terms of their demographics and their high growth companies, the curve has actually three ranges and another turning point. Now, where we're actually moving towards is really currently we're at the first inflection point all the way on the left, demographically speaking, and moving more towards the left. But that is across all counties, and certainly not all counties are at the average demographics. We do see there are some counties that have made it work with a very high share of Generation X to Millennials. So there is, for at least some outliers, another sweet spot. Of course, it's just also for counties that actually do have high growth companies. But most counties are at the beginning of, of the most left range and moving further left, as I mentioned. And that will continue as millennials are completely entered the workforce and Generation X is starting to retire. Now, what this graph really tells us, though, where you are on this curve as a county you might need a big jump in the younger generation before you see a return in relation to, to high growth companies. Or if you already are in an ideal ratio, adding more can actually, all else equal, um, detrimental. So if your workforce shows twice as many Gen X as to millennials, to get to the sweet spot to the left might take a big workforce development or attraction effort. But once you're getting close to there, there might be, for the time being, a, a time where the experience is still something that will be necessary to drive forward the growth company. We were then actually also wondering how geographically diverse the results are. So where are those regions where the millennials dominate or at least have an equal share and show a high concentration uh, of, of potential growth companies? So the, the kind of the most left sweet spot. And it's I guess good to see that the results are diverse. Um, they certainly can be found across the US, but the counties are with a strong association uh, with high growth companies and that kind of generational combination mix are particularly present in Texas and North Dakota and in the Midwest. Now, this alone can obviously turn into an academic paper, but as a start, we wanted to at least check whether something obvious like the industry mix um, plays a role. However, across these three different ranges, the vast majority of industries with high growth firms are the same. So if you're going, if you're looking at the graph again and you're wondering, well, the only reason 
why the companies, the counties on all the way on the right hand side have been able to make it work is because they might have a combination of industries that uh, really require very experienced workers and um, that is the only reason why they were able to uh, make it uh, make this mix work that does not seem to be a case there's slight shifts in if you look at the top 10 states in terms of moving up and uh, down within the top 10 industries but the majority of them will be very consistent across the different sectors So given that that is not the case, again, there's obviously a lot more to be investigated. This is, of course, also just a snapshot, meaning we looked at our current projections of companies. An interesting exercise would certainly be to track these developments over time. So again, if you look at the curve, how would it shift over time? Would the curve look slightly different if we look one year ago, two year ago, three year ago, if we forecast it forward uh, a couple of years when experience level change, when workforce development uh, strategies change? So that is something actually um, Dr. Kelly is currently working on, on a blog uh, that will come out in the next couple of weeks on, on demographics. Um, that uh, should be very insightful if you're interested um, to read a bit more about that. But the bottom line is where you are on the curve can have an impact on the needed workforce development, on workforce attraction strategies. But just like there was the case with the business taxes, there are several sweet spots that relate to a high share of potential growth companies. And that's something that fairly quickly falls out of our big data without having to commit to an extensive literature review or, or survey. And that it holds at the sector level, independent of what industry you're trying to grow. But on the other hand, it, it will impact the attractiveness of a region for specific companies. A company, for example, that requires a higher share of experienced workers or rather a larger pool of young workers that they prefer to train themselves. Sometimes we have increasingly heard, especially in the manufacturing sector, we say don't we don't need certificates, we don't need anything, we just need willing, dedicated workers that we can train ourselves. We don't want them to, to waste time. We need them right now because we're all running out of workers. So depending on, on the type of company and where are they are in their business model, where they are in their growth stage, they will of course have demand for a different mix of demographics as well. So again, this is of course um, you know, a snapshot but I think what we have overall learned from this exercise uh, here at, at Gazelle and ROI, that companies with the strongest growth potential uh, are especially concentrated for almost half of the industrial groups, meaning there's a, a lack of diversity of growth and expansion. And the highest concentrations of, of potential growth companies were actually found in construction, in the management of companies, in a finance and in retail, which we dug into a little bit more. And then those sectors that were excessively concentrated, again, where the potential gazelles are in a few or even just one sector, much more focused than what the sector overall would, um, would allude to, it becomes much more important to allocate your resources efficiently. So that, for example, were also sectors that were excessively concentrated in materials and wholesale. At the same time, it also means that even in disrupted sectors, there are growth niche areas that company information can highlight. So even when you're stuck with the next codes, you still can dig into growth companies um, by tracking them with signals such as, you know, having featured lists and uh, looking for, and even tracking industries by looking at who the innovators are and where they are taking the industry and how are they driving it forward and through what approaches or niche segments that can give you some insight into basically where the next codes are headed and what type of companies are potentially driving you forward. 
So that's this exercise of, of looking at, at the trends and, and how we can kind of relate it to what's going on and, and whether we can learn more for it um, helped us uh, really to understand how and in what cases we need to fine tune our targeting strategies and investigate it a little bit more when somebody comes to us and says, well, we want to target all, all, all manufacturing. And we're saying, well, what kind? And they're saying, well, maybe all fabricated manufacturing, uh, fabricated metals. And even there, we're saying, well, let's just look at our data and, of course, our experience in the market. But our trends and our forecasts for growth companies that might help us with a better starting point of, of what makes goes and what type of companies are more primed to be in the more likely realm of expansion in the, in the near future so that we can start at the right point. So I hope you found uh, this uh, information insightful and of course please feel free to contact me uh, at any point. You have uh, my contact information at the end of the slide, as well as our presence, uh, Stephen Jast, who has um, developed gazelle.ai. And uh, thank you for joining the webinar today. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, I hope everyone was able to get as uh, great takeaways as I was able to. Um, we'll now begin the question and answer portion of the webinar. Um, we have received a few couple questions regarding the availability of the presentation after the webinar. Uh, the full webinar and presentation will be made available on the C2ER and the LMI Institute websites a few days after the webinar. Uh, as soon as they are available, we'll be sending out a follow-up email to all the attendees uh, with links where they can be downloaded. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and uh, jump in. Uh, so the first question, Nadine. Um, so we we're looking at the, the top three NAICS codes to target in each sector. I want to know if uh, the, the, the group would like to know if those three NAICS code sectors change much over time or do they remain consistent? Yeah, so, so the way, yeah, so that's, that's an excellent question. The top three NAICS codes, so that was the, the table where we said for each of the sectors, you know, here are the top three NAICS codes where most of the, the highest share of high growth firms is, uh, are located that are driving the results for that sector. And we certainly see that the horizon for changing, for that changing is probably between, in our experience, between 12 to 18 months. Now, we never expect them to completely flip around and want to fall off, uh, fall off, uh, fall off the, the the, the top three or even the top ten, but you know the second one might move to number one and so on. But the ones especially where they're so dominated, where we saw, as you remember, the the index of over 2,000 uh, within a year or a year and a half, we do not see those changing um, radically. Once when you, as long as you look at six-digit next codes, now that the firms within those next code change for sure, that's that's certain within each year, within each quarter, within each month. The propensity of a company to expand might change, but the top NAICs that are dominating those sectors in terms of high growth firms um, seems to be at least consistent about for a year or two. Thank you, Nadine. Uh, so next question. Uh, your, your demographics data seem to show that having a higher share of millennials proportional to generation Xers will lead to fewer high growth firms. Is this always the case? Uh, I guess what's what's the underlying trend driving this? Yeah, so I think, as I mentioned, um, we're kind of just, as, as the millennial generation is not still completely in the workforce, we're still on that on that graph, the, the, the S shape, so to say, the lying down S shape graph. Um, we're still moving towards the left. And it's it's a snapshot in time right now. So what it what it tells us at the moment and what it tells us based on the impact of the generation X is is the experience is what drives most likely the difference. Again, this is one factor. A lot of other factors could play a role, but it stands to reason that we have done some investigation on how these change over time. That the longer the millennial generation is in the workforce and accumulates experience, the less 
radical that drop off that you saw kind of the first rise up so to say or in our case since we're moving to the left the fall down of the high growth firm shares with more millennials the less pronounced that fall will be and eventually we're expecting to see another uptick so another curve we're saying oh now we're at a, at a point where from a generational perspective they're in a position now to drive the majority of growth companies that before the next uh, generation was driving. Thank you. Um, so we have a question here. Construction can grow rapid, rapidly when the economy is in recovery, but can crash during an outturn. Do you have a long-term outlook for the construction industry? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wouldn't wouldn't be nice to watch uh, ten years in the future. So no, the the way the way we work um, in terms of construction, the construction sector. No, but the way our our analysis and and the way we run our AI, we're really looking out towards in terms of finding individual companies. We're looking at the next twelve to eighteen months. That's what we really. That's the horizon we're looking at. What is going to expand in the next 12 to 18 months. Now, based on our own work and experience in the market, we combine that information, of course, with is this just a blip or has this been happening now for a longer time? And certainly macroeconomic factors will come into play, especially when it comes to sectors like uh, construction. And, and uh, you know, so for us, it's, it's something that we combine with what we have experienced over the last two or three years and looking at how our data has changed over the last couple of years. So again, a lot of this information is our snapshots. When we, of course, use it, we look at it over a longer time horizon and see how it changes over time. And that would be very important because for just looking at it right now, it would just give us insight for the next 12 to 18 months and uh, what is going on and or and including kind of the last year or so because that's of course driving the trends but in terms of a even five-year outlook we would look at it more for uh, tracking these kind of charts and graphs over several years to see what has been changing and where is it moving towards thank you nadine and then uh, i think this is going to be our last question we're we're running uh, short on time so uh, it's impossible for a small organization to track a large set of companies to get a sense of what's going on in an industry. What strategy do you suggest uh, to get at some of this information, to, you know, to be able to track the large number of companies, figure out what's going on in the industry? Yeah, I, I think yeah, that's, that's always a great question and one that ha we have heard before. How, how do you keep tabs on everything if you have one person that's keeping tab on everything? Um, I think really when it comes to using company information for industry insights, it's all about tracking the innovators. So I, I mentioned before, in terms of if you look at the Inc. 5000, it's, it's kind of a case study approach, um, but it, I think it can give you a lot of great insights besides, of course, talking to your own companies. Um, but going through the Inc. 5000 of sectors you're trying to tag and track, and pick out a couple of companies that have been doing well, especially those that have been doing well for a while, and just see what what they are doing and what market segments are they active? What have they done? You know, usually things like the Forbes magazine, and specialized industry industry magazines, will have case studies and highlights and interviews of of the CEOs and kind of the movers and shakers to see whether that is just an result of very skilled management or whether they are driving the industry forward in a certain way and others are starting to follow along because of a new business model new production model uh, a new way of uh, entering certain markets combining certain technologies i think that is that is really the, the best and only starting point with limited uh, resources from my perspective uh, besides then obviously looking at just industry publications and, and outlooks and and intelligence uh, as for the overall industry sector 
Well, Nadine, thank you uh, so much for sharing your presentation today. Uh, as I said before, I, th I thought it was fantastic um, and great for anyone who isn't familiar with uh, Gazelle.ai before. For anyone attending the annual conference in St. Louis in June, be sure to stop by the vendor area to say hello to the fine folks from Gazelle.ai and learn more about their exciting and innovative products. Uh, this full webinar and presentation will be made available on the C2ER and the LMI Institute website a few days after the webinar. We will also send a follow-up email to all attendees with links to where you will be able to download the presentation and the webinar recording. Uh, thank you, and from Arlington, Virginia, have an excellent afternoon. Thank you.